title of the message tonight is All Appearance of Evil. All Appearance of Evil. Before I preach that, I'll just mention pretty soon. I don't know how long it'll be, but I want to preach a message. Uh, I've been thinking about it for a long time, and I'm just not quite there yet. This is a first step. This is a more obvious and needed step, I think, before we get to that. But it has to do with the idea of how sometimes we'll do certain things or give up certain things or change our behavior or whatever based on the fact that we don't want other people to look at us. And basically it's like a judgment thing. Like we don't want them to look at us and think, uh, you know, that we're bad people. So we'll do it and we'll do it actually for the view for, for other people and not for the Lord. But the point that I want to make in that message is that that's not necessarily wrong. In fact, God put some things into place so that that would exactly be the case. I mean, we don't want to be punished, so we'll do certain things, or we don't want to be, uh, you know, judged to be one way or another, so we'll do certain things. Now, obviously, our first priority should be to please God in everything we do. That should be our main reason. Uh, but the question is, is it good that we would think about what other people think about us? You know, we'll do the, what, uh, you know is, our impure, uh, is our appearance in that way important? Okay, so just I wanted to throw that out there. Uh, because this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, let's look at it again. It says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, it's hard to actually say, well, what's the context behind that? Because when you read in there, there's a lot of things that are just kind of thrown in there as kind of these just basic thoughts. And so regardless of how you interpret this verse, you could kind of read into your interpretation based on that uh, that context there, but the, there are scoffers today. A lot of scoffers who will um, laugh at, I guess, or or mock preachers who would use that verse to say, "Hey, you got to be careful, you know, what other people if don't do something if it might make somebody else think that you're doing something wrong." You know, does that make sense? Because I, I think everybody in here is probably familiar with that interpretation. We stay away from all appearance of evil. What we mean by that is. You know, don't do something, put yourself in a situation where others will then may have question, like maybe they're doing something wrong or whatever. And so a lot of the here's here's some of the reasons that they mock at that. And I'm talking about just modern theologians, uh, so-called scholars and a lot of Baptist preachers. I've heard them. Uh, I've seen on Facebook or read articles or heard people talk about that and say, Oh, those independent Baptists, you know, those those old fashioned old timers, you know, that always talk about, you know, stay away from all appearance of evil. They don't even know what that verse means. They mistranslate that verse. Well, so naturally, here are the modern versions, okay, that they use. Okay, the NIV, instead of saying uh, abstain from all appearance of evil, it says reject every kind of evil. And I've heard him explain it this way, like what that means, like like appearance there doesn't mean what you think it means. It's like, it's like whenever evil appears, avoid it. That's what it means. Like it don't stay away from the appearance of evil like you think it means. It means when evil appears, you know, abstain from it. <laughs> okay. And so you can see how that's kind of shown in the modern versions. Reject every kind of evil. Abstain from every form of evil. Just all forms of evil, just abstain for it, okay? And, yeah, you could read into that and say, like, okay, well, then one form of evil would be, like, you know, looking, looking, uh, appearing to be evil. Uh, but anyway, the NASV and even the New King James Version, which is supposed to be based on uh, the same manuscripts that we use. I don't, I've heard that it's really not, uh, but oftentimes it goes with the ESV or the NIV, and it says abstain from every form. So pretty much the only version out there that says all appearance of evil is the King James and a couple of the uh, predecessor. I mean, the, you know, a couple of the Bible versions before the King James, you know, Bishop's Bible or whatever. Now, um, uh, there is one other version of the Bible and I hate to ever like line up with this one, but sometimes it's surprising how much it follows It's because it was based off the same manuscripts probably, but the Dewey Rames, which for a long time was like the Catholic Bible. I don't think it's even accept, accepted anymore as a Catholic Bible, if I'm not mistaken. But the Dewey Reigns Bible says, from all appearance of evil, refrain yourself. That sounds a lot more like, you know, the way I've always heard it. And I mean, I grew up with this interpretation, like, now don't do that. You know, people might think that you're doing something bad. You want to abstain from every, all appearance of evil. And so I believe that that is exactly what the verse means. And, uh, and uh, I think you can see that there in the context a little bit. But here's the funny thing about it. Okay, so 
playing the game of the scholars, you know, which is, I don't know, really know Greek, but I'm going to go back to the Greek and I'm going to use lexicons and stuff like that. Okay, let's just play the game for a minute. I don't remember what the Greek word is. I don't really care about that part, but the Greek word is used in the Greek in, in the uh, New Testament. It's used four times. Okay, one time, I guess it would be five times. One time is this this in First Thessalonians where it says appearance of evil. Okay, and then <coughs> it's used four other times in the in the authorized version. And here is what it says: three times it's used. The word form is used. And one time the word sight is used. Let's look at those. John chapter 5, verse 37. And I'm not going to spend the whole time just proving this point. I just want to get this out of the way by introduction so that I can go on with the rest of the message. But John chapter 5, I mean, yeah, John chapter 5. And look at verse 37. It says, and he, hath, and he hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is a son of man. That's not right. For, uh, uh, John chapter 5, 37. That was 27. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Okay, so uh, so you haven't seen his, his uh, form uh, at any time. Doesn't it say form? Uh, no, voice. Or, or seen his shape. That's right. The other, the other translation is shape. So shape, form, uh, appearance. Those are the different, or sight. Those are the different uh, words that are used. Okay. It says you haven't seen his uh, voice. I mean, or you haven't seen his shape. Okay. Uh, uh, so the idea there is that you, have, uh, you haven't seen what the father looks like. Uh, he, uh, so you have, you have seen, I'm getting confused here because I feel like that's not the right verse, but, uh, but I believe that is. Okay. Let's just move on. Luke chapter three, Luke chapter three. <clears throat> I will just give a quick disclaimer real quick. You see my, this page right here, this is a invoice for, uh, my oil change. All right. <laughs> I got all the way here and realized I only grabbed two pages off my printer and I've got a page still at the house. So the first, so my first page I had to handwrite by memory. So I might've got that verse wrong. That's why I kind of puzzled, got puzzled for a minute. Luke chapter three, verse 22. And the Holy ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. So here's the word shape again. I was thinking it was the word form that was used. Verse uh, Chapter 9, Luke 9, verse 29. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And his raiment was uh, white and glistering. So they're actually the word fashion. So I, I was wrong on which words are used. Okay. But the same, all these words are, are still saying, are still staying the same thing. Okay. So the fashion, all these things have to do with like what you saw, how he was fashioned, his form. You know what I mean? All these have to do with, with what you saw because you didn't really know what he looked like, but you saw this form or whatever. Okay. Go to uh, second Corinthians now. Second Corinthians. In verse five. Second Corinthians verse five. I'm sorry, chapter five, verse seven. Chapter five, verse seven. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That word sight there is the word that we use. Now, again, I don't care about going back to the Greek and everything. I think you can read the context in all these places and see what it means. But here's the point that I'm trying to make is that if you're going to go back and look at how these words are used, what is it saying there? It's saying that we, we don't, we don't, you know, when we, when we walk in our life, we don't care, you know, what we can actually see. What, it, what something appears like, right? Wouldn't that be the same word? We don't care what something appears like. We're going to go by what the Bible says. We're going to go by faith. And so that word that they're using there, sight or form or shape or all these kinds of things, have to do with the idea that, you know, we, uh, in, in, in application to 1 Thessalonians 5, we don't want to do what appears like or has the form of or is in someone else's sight, 
You understand what I'm saying? Evil. So we want to stay away from all appearance of evil. It really just fits very, very uh, easily with what the rest of the, the Bible uses when it uses that word. Okay. So anyway, that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? See why I don't go back to the Greek very often? <laughs> so does that make sense? We don't want to do what would appear like to somebody else to or be the form of or or be in their sight something that is evil. So here's what the, uh, the scholars or the modern theologians will say. They'll say, well, you know, if, 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 you're, if you are going to take that application, you're going to take that view. Maybe they'll point to some old preachers that said, hey, we don't want to do that, or, you know, we don't want to go here. We don't. Then, uh, then what they say is that you are going to be a slave. This is an actual quote that somebody used. Then you're going to be a slave to the perception of others. And you don't want to go around your life being a slave to their perception. And they'll even quote uh, the scripture. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, this is the same book, right? This is uh, just a few chapters before our text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> and look at verse 4. But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. So they'll say this, say, hey, we shouldn't, according to the Bible, we shouldn't be about pleasing man. We should only be about pleasing God, right? Now that's true. We all agree with that. But is that saying then that we shouldn't care what men think about us at all? No, that's not what it's saying at all. Here's the, here's the, the context of what he's saying, and here is the, the right way to see what he's saying. He's saying, look, we don't want to uh, not do what we know would ple is pleasing to God because we are wanting to please man. Okay, We don't want to uh, you know, offend God so that we can please man. And look, this is what people do on a regular basis. Like, I don't want to offend that guy. And so they'll go ahead and be nice to them and say the wrong thing or, or appeal to this person. And in doing so, they're offending God. That's what we say. Hey, we want to obey God rather than man. We care about what God says, not about what man says. But wait a minute. But God says to stay away from the appearance of evil, right? So by, by, by being careful what man thinks of us in that way, we're obeying God. And so like, uh, so there's nothing contradictory there. It's not like, hey, we don't, want, we don't really care what men think about us. You know, we just go do whatever we want. All we care about is what God thinks about. Well, guess what? God cares that you care about what other people think about you. It is a, it is a scriptural uh, thing. It, may, it makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, we also know, of course, that the Bible talks about how we're not supposed to be a stumbling block to others. And, and there's a lot of places we could go in the Bible about that. Okay, but, uh, but I hope you understand. So I, I, I don't believe that they're right in saying, oh, you know, King James got it wrong. Or even some people that are King James only will still take that approach and say, well, yeah, it does say appearance. But what it means is every time it appears, avoid it, right? I don't believe that's what it's saying. I believe it says, you know, avoid anything that appears to be evil, right? Even if you say, well, I wasn't sinning and doing it. If somebody could accuse you of sinning, that's a big deal. And that could be a stumbling block to others. Look, think about the ramifications for that, okay? You got people, you got, you know, maybe your kids. You know, you're doing something and your kids uh, are like, oh, you know, you know, mom and dad don't have a problem with X, Y, Z. You know, that, that could be a bad deal. This is something we've in our life had to, had to consider many times about our kids. Like, you know, we know why we're doing what we're doing, but from our kids' perspective, hey, we're doing something that they're not allowed to do. <laughs> Let me give you a classic example, and I hate to use it because I wish I could just tell you, hey, we never watch TV. We have like a no TV rule because that would be like the absolute, like best, uh, perfect, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, view on this. But we've, uh, we've throughout our kids' lives watched TV way more than we should, no doubt. And by TV, I mean movies, okay, because we don't really watch any TV like sitcoms, whatever. Okay, but when we were, when my kids were really young, we were super strict on what they watched. Does that make sense? Like, like you know, we had, we had some really strict rules by the world standards <laughs> or the average Christian standards even on things that they couldn't watch for this reason or that reason. We can go down the line. <clears throat> but what we would do after they go to bed, we would watch a movie that we wouldn't let them watch. 
And we justified that as, well, we understand some of the content here. It's not going to affect us like what it affects them. But you know what the kids see? The kids see, hey, those are bad movies and mom and dad are watching them. And they don't really know what, why we're watching, you know, does, does that make sense? And so that's something that in my own life, I had to realize that, hey, we could be causing our kids to say, hey, mom and dad are okay with it. So guess what? Whenever I get older, I'm going to do this. Or, you know, and then their mind is just like, hey, I, you know, maybe they even think mom and dad are lying or, or something like that. We got to be real careful about that. That's just, per, I'm going to use a lot of personal uh, 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 examples here. Okay. That's a, uh, that's something that I just thought about wasn't in my notes, but let me tell you what I put in my notes. Okay. And, 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 and here's exactly why the average pastor, preacher, uh, mo- kind of modern, you know, uh, type preacher doesn't like that uh, interpretation that I've always grown up using for that verse. Okay. Cause they want to be able to do things. They want to be able to do things and not have somebody judge them. And so they don't want anybody to say, hey, that's the appearance of evil. They'll be like, oh, I'm not a slave to your perception of me, right? But let me uh, just say, here's one thing that I've actually heard of preachers do- doing. Uh, hopefully, hopefully they weren't Baptists, but maybe they probably were, okay? I've heard of Baptists going into bars. And being like, you know what? Jesus hung out with sinners and they were uh, drinking and they were doing all this stuff, which is not what the Bible says. It says they accused him of doing these things. But, and he was sitting down with them and they're drinking, no doubt. And they're like, you know, where I've, I've seen people put this on Facebook. You know, Jesus, we're walking on the earth today. He'd be hanging out at the bars and the strip clubs and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? But they want to say that, you know, hey, we can do whatever we want. It's only, you know, as long as our heart's right and, uh, and God knows our intentions, God knows our motives. Meanwhile, people have no idea why, why the person's in that bar. So there's literally like a pastor we were reading about who, who started a, a ministry to, in, in a strip club, like with, with basically prostitutes, okay? And what happened was the women were actually the ones that went in there. And they were sitting in there and then they tried to talk to these ladies. And next thing you know, they're like giving them food baskets and they're trying to help them financially and do all this kind of stuff. And, and then they were like, you know what? We can't really minister effectively to these guys. They need a preacher. And so they started some kind of Bible study and the, and the list lady's husband was a pastor and actually would go into the nightclub uh, right before, the, before their, uh, their dance routine or whatever, I don't know, and have a little Bible study with them or whatever. And you know how many Christians would be like, I don't see anything wrong with that. Jesus would do that. Hey, he's going there where the sinners, they look, you know, the church is supposed to be a hospital for the sick and, and not a museum for, you know, <laughs> you know, all the things that people say, right? What's wrong with them doing that? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with them doing that. Number one, there's a huge, occasion, there's a huge opportunity for the guy to go in there to stumble Right. And to and to see something or think about something or or end up being involved in something he shouldn't be involved in. And God, a lot of times in the Bible says, flee that kind of stuff and don't and don't look at it. Stay away from it. Uh, alcohol is another example I'll get to in a minute. But and they go into that. And the other thing is people are going to accuse them. You know, there's going to be room for accusation. All right. So, look, no, I would never go sit in a bar. In fact, when we go to a restaurant. I was just talking about this the other day. Uh, probably nobody in here knows Brother Art Wilson, but um, Art Wilson was a, a preacher. He lived to be 102 or something like that. I can't remember the exact age. And he was just a well-known preacher in Oklahoma and Missouri and Kansas and evangelist. And and uh, uh, anyway, he kind of has a big had a big name back in the day. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people have forgotten about him. But um, when I first went to Heartland, he was still living. He was in, like I said, he was in his hundreds, in the hundreds, I believe, at least 90s. Uh, but I believe he made it to 100. And they had him come preach. Now, he's completely blind. He needed to be led by the hand and everything. And one day we went to a steak, uh, steakhouse there that's kind of close to the college. And it was pretty popular around there. I always felt a little weird going in there because they had a bar. Now, you can't hardly go into any restaurant anymore that, that, doesn't have some kind of bar or, or something. But I kind of felt weird about that because not only did this place have a bar, but it had a huge dance, like a, a what do you call it? A, 
yeah, dance hall, like a dance floor, you know, where people would get up and dance. And they said, well, on Friday nights, this becomes a dance hall and there's drinking and there's all this kind of stuff. And I always felt really weird. So we, we didn't, after a while, we kind of just stopped going there. <clears throat> but we had went a couple times and I was like, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't be here. Well, one day, we, the last time we went in there, lo and behold, uh, the, the president, the, not the executive vice president or whatever from Heartland comes in with Art Wilson to that restaurant and sends him down right in the middle of this dance floor. And I'm like, because I mean, I had just started college. I didn't know how people felt about these things, but I'm just looking at like, if he knew he was sitting in a dance hall and that there was alcohol served over there, and over, what, would he, what would he think? The truth is, I have no idea, <laughs> okay? Maybe he wouldn't have had a problem with it. Look, when we go to places, we understand, hey, we live in the world. You can't avoid the world. You can't go to Walmart. They sell alcohol. You can't go to the gas station, you know? So at some point, you have to understand that that's just the way that the world is. But here's one thing that we do have a huge conviction of. If they, we go into a restaurant and they're like, hey, we got a seat right over here. And it's like, you sit there and the bar's like right there. You know, they're basically sitting you in the bar. We'll say, no, 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 could we have a different seat? Because we don't want somebody to walk in and say, hey, I saw the Randalls over there sitting by the bar. Now, some preachers and some Bible theologians would laugh at me about that. <laughs> You're so concerned about what other people think. Don't you know that that doesn't matter? God sees your heart and Jesus would have done that and whatever. I don't believe so. I believe that that setting yourself up for an appearance of evil. Somebody could think, you know, hey, it's no big deal. I saw Pastor Randall over there. He didn't have a problem with it. Next thing you know, this guy that used to struggle with alcohol in his life, now he goes and sits in a bar someday. Nobody's around. He's like, you know what? I think I'm going to order something. You know, who knows what that could, how that could cause somebody to stumble. And so we need to just stay away from any appearance of that. Here's another thing I have a conviction of, uh, and you might laugh at this, okay? But now, if, if, if we were sitting right here and somebody gave me a root beer and one of those brown glasses, right? I believe everybody in here would know that that's root beer. <laughs> okay, I'm just assuming that everybody in here would be okay with that. But if I'm driving down the street and I'm drinking that, or I'm in, I'm around other people who are drinking alcohol and I'm drinking that, or like, I guess they actually have like non-alcoholic beers. It's, I don't know if it's really non-alcoholic or what, but I was in this one. Uh, in fact, the, the first 100 miler I did, they gave you this, uh, this goodie bag had all kind of free samples of different things. And I pulled this thing out and it was a beer. And I was like, God, ah, get rid of that thing. Later on, I, and I threw it in the trash or whatever. Now, great. Now the trash man probably saw it. <laughs> so I threw it in the trash. Got rid of Later on, I found out, no, that was non-alcoholic beer. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to drink it. Number one, I don't, who wants to drink the stuff anyway? Um, and then, and then, you know, it was just the appearance and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so anyway, like even root beer, like it's in the brown, the brown glass or whatever, you know, or how about this? Uh, kids used to use that, that uh, uh, chewing gum that looked like chewing tobacco and they would put that chewing gum in there and they put the thing in their back and now they got a ring in their back pocket. Now everyone's going to look at that and think, hey, that guy's, you know, chews tobacco. How, how dare you judge me, right? No, it's the appearance of evil. We should avoid the appearances of evil. Uh, now here's one that, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult. Some people uh, disagree with me about this, uh, but I'm going to tell you what, I've never seen the results of this turn out good. Okay. And uh, that is when people, uh, male and female, or unfortunately nowadays, we even got to worry about the same sex sometimes, but when they're in situations together where other people might look at that and say, Hey, there's something going on there. Okay. Uh, this is a, a, a problem. And, and, you know, I've talked to many people about this who don't share that view. And, and I've had people, uh, I don't want to get uh, any particular examples, okay, but I've, I've talked to people and said, man, it, you know, it doesn't look good. You know, people are going to think, uh, you know, somebody brought somebody to church. Their, their wife didn't come to church with them. And so they started bringing some other people to church. And I said, man, people are going to start wondering who are these ladies that he's bringing to church? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I've always had a policy. Now, I'm not saying I've, I've been 100% on that my whole life, but I've always had a policy not to be in any situation where I could be caught. Like there was a lady that came uh, to the church parking lot. I was just going in the church. I didn't even have shoes on. I was running to the church to get something, and then I was going to bring it home. And when I ran in there, there's a lady that walking across the parking lot. She said, excuse me, sir, can you just run me down to the Super 8 real quick? I don't want to walk that far. And I was thinking in my mind, like, I could give her a ride. It's not that far. It's not a big deal. She sees I'm the pastor right here and all this kind of stuff. But I was like, 
I'll have to go get my wife. Will you stay here just for a minute? And I drove home, got my wife, and my wife came. And look, there are some things that men don't know, okay? <laughs> there are some things apparently men don't know. Women have a, a, a certain uh, feel about things or something like that. But after my wife took her there and, and everything, she was like, I'm so glad you didn't take her because that would not have been a good situation. And she talked to her and found out some things about her and everything. But look, we don't want, can you imagine like all of a sudden the talk around Iola was like, hey, we saw that pastor of Iola Baptist Temple driving around with this girl that was, you know, a, a you know, prostitute or something like that. And, and so we don't want to get into those situations. We have to make good choices. Now, is it a sin if your motive wasn't right and you didn't think about that? or whatever? Not necessarily, but we should be thinking about it. We've got to be thinking about that. And... Uh, and that's what the message is going to be about. I'll give you another example. Here's something that I think about a lot too. And we have strict, we, we try to have strict rules at our, in our house. Now, you know, uh, people can always break rules. Uh, but growing up, the kids didn't have any devices like internet uh, type devices. And then whenever they did, there was a strict rule. Hey, you can never be alone with that device. Right. And we would try to do uh, parental controls and we'd do curfews and all that stuff early on. Later on, we got a little lax, but the idea was still, hey, you don't go take a device in the other room. You can't be found in the room with a device. Why do you think that is? Now, they could say, I never did anything. You know, I never looked at anything I wasn't supposed to look at. I never talked to anybody I wasn't supposed to talk to. Yeah, but how do we know that? How does anybody know that? Number one, there's an opportunity. There's an occasion for the flesh there. Number two, there's an appearance there that other people don't understand why you uh, did what you did. So we have to be very careful to put uh, guards up in our lives. Okay. Now, admittedly, and I've already just kind of admitted this a couple times, uh, unknowing, I mean, un, un, un purposely. admittedly as a leader of the church and even as a head of my own household, I personally have not always been as strong of a leader as I should in these areas. Okay. Sometimes I'm really slow to acting upon things that have the appearance of evil and I probably should be more proactive Okay, and I'll tell you why, just straight, be straightforward with you. Most of you guys know my heart, and you've talked to me about different things and understand. You've even seen, since the history of this church, we've seen some situations that, like, man, how should I deal with that situation? And we've, we've let them go sometimes a little bit longer. But here's the reason why. Number one is because, and I think this is, is, is important to, to uh, mention, okay? Number one, I know my own faults. Now, when we're honest about our faults and we know that we have sin in our life and we know, uh, I mean, we need to get sin right, but I know historically, you know, we've had different sins and stuff like that. We know that we're human. We know the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, right? When you know that, man, it's so easy to show mercy to somebody and it's so hard to be hard on them, right? Especially if it's something that you've struggled with in your life or something like that. And I think that is the cause sometimes for me being slow to judge because I'm like, man, I know what that's like. But you see what it's not, I'm getting ahead of myself, but, but we do have a responsibility to deal with it. Okay. Uh, number two is I don't want to get into this overly judgmental, being quick to judge and sometimes coming across hypocritical or even being wrong about something. And then now I've got, you know, uh, to go back and apologize and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's the kind of struggles that I go through personally in, in trying to decide, you know, how proactive do I be about these kinds of things? But we do have a responsibility as a church, and me as the pastor, I've got the responsibility to make sure that as a church we do that, do this, to deal with certain things. Okay. Now, here's what the Bible says. Go to, uh, uh, well, let's go to First Timothy first. First Timothy three. First Timothy three, verse four. This is one of the qualifications of a pastor, one that ruleth well his own house. What's he mean ruleth? You know, I've heard some people try to give some weird, weird uh, application to that, but I think it's pretty obvious. You know, somebody who, well, in fact, it goes on, having his children in subjection, right, with all gravity. For if a man knoweth not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? I, I think it's pretty easy to, to see what it's talking about there, saying that the you know, qualification of a pastor is that he needs to be able to Rule his house in the sense of he needs to have rules and he needs to enforce things. This isn't going to fly in my house, you know. Now, look, 
how strict does he have to be? You know, who's going to be the one that sets the standards? Uh, you know, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're just saying somebody who just cares about putting laws in place, keep his household, you know, ruled well, according to biblical principles. And so there's a reason that God wants the pastor to, to have that. And then also the deacons, uh, similarly, and any person that's going to be in a leadership position in the church, really. Okay. So why is it important? Look at first Corinthians five familiar passage. We've been there. I've preached from this many times, first Corinthians five. And the reason I, I preach from this so much and try to, <laughs> my message yesterday is to stir you up, to stir uh, uh, your, rem your rem remembrance, to bring you into remembrance of this. Because preachers, a lot, of, a lot of preachers aren't preaching this. And they don't really, it's like, hey, the door's wide open. Anybody can come into the church, come as long as you want. Doesn't matter, you know, uh, uh, you know we, uh, to the extent that they will have homosexuals in the choir, I mean, you know, just there's this open door sometimes where it pre preaches. And I'm like, what are you missing? Okay, the Bible is very clear about how church is supposed to be and how we don't want certain things to be in the church. Okay, so here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> Let me just read the whole thing. It's not that long. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, look, he's addressing this particular situation, but you could put any matter of sin there and it would still work. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in the body, but present in the spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? All right. If a church just continues to allow these small things and just not deal with it and let it go, uh, it will grow into a bigger thing. And before you know it, you got a whole lot of problems in the church. So it says, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are, uh, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet, not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Now, I hit on this all the time, so I'm sure you understand this, but uh, I mean, I'm not sure of anything, but I hope that you understand this. It's saying that when you go out in the world, you expect the world to act like the world. You understand that there are going to be people who are, you know, living in all these sins. We want to give them the gospel. So how are we going to, you know, give them the gospel if we don't tolerate the fact that they're our sinners, okay? But that doesn't mean to embrace them and just become their best buds and do everything that they do, uh, not at all. But what the Bible actually teaches in this text, the, the main thing that he's saying is, hey, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about those people in the church who call themselves brethren. And here's what it says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So he's saying you want to keep the church clean. And so when you find out that somebody's involved in a gross sin, and by gross, I mean just something that's obvious and it's like a big mark against the church. And you don't want to put uh, put up with that and tolerate it. You want to deal with it, nip it in the bud, so to speak. Okay. Now, the Bible also makes it clear that our objection should always be to restore a brethren. Okay. Now, there, the exception there would be uh, a false prophet or somebody who we would think was reprobate. Okay. Maybe based on certain behavior, we'd be like, Hey, I don't know. That person might be lying to me about the fact that they even believe because they show the, all the signs of somebody who's a reprobate. We might not welcome them no matter what they say back into the assembly, but a person who comes and is repentant and, and doesn't want to do this and wants help, 
you know, with a certain thing that's going on in their life or whatever. Uh, we do want to have mercy in a show. Now, it doesn't mean there's not going to be some kind of discipline, but we do want to be able to restore them. So we don't want to just think that, hey, everybody, we just kind of kick out and it's just we never welcome them back. We never, you know, they're just evil for the rest of their life. Uh, that's not the idea. The idea is to hold them accountable and say, hey, if you're not going to get this right, we're going to treat you as a heathen and a publican, so to speak, so that we can, uh, uh, you know, so you'll come back and say, hey, I don't, I need help with this. I don't want to be that way anymore. Okay, but here's the problem: we can't always take people at their word and give them the benefit of the doubt. What do I mean by that? If I see something that looks, has the appearance of one of these things, and I go to that person and say, hey, are you involved in this? And they say, no. What is my job? Should I just be like, oh, okay, no problem, and they just let that go? I don't believe that that was right, okay? I believe that we need to begin judging somebody based on the appearance of evil. Now, some people would call me the legalist and all that kind of stuff for saying this, but here's the thing. I will give you two points that it will be the, the bulk of the, or not the bulk of the message. My introduction is the bulk of the message. <laughs> two things, it'll be the, the, the finality of what I'm, where I'm going, okay? <clears throat> but the thing is, we have to start based on what is the appearance of evil and approach that and say, hey, we're going to start here. We're going to investigate. We're going to see what we can find out. Uh, it has to start there. And we can't just give them the benefit of the doubt when they say, no, no, I'm not doing anything like that. And here's the reason why this very, very simple. Okay. Number one, people lie, <laughs> right? Number one, people lie. You know, I've looked people in the face knowing that they're guilty of a certain sin and say, Hey, are you guilty of doing this? No. What are you talking about? Now, what would you expect them to do? I mean, isn't that human nature? Which of you have caught in a bad sin, an embarrassing sin, maybe, or whatever, which of you would say, Oh yeah, yeah, you're, you caught me. <laughs> you know, it just usually doesn't happen. And unfortunately, now here's the reality. Typically, if a person is struggling with a certain sin and he goes to someone and says, man, I'm struggling with this sin. I need help. You know what? People have a lot more mercy for that person than the person that's like, no, I'm not doing that. What are you talking about? And then they keep doing it and then they keep hiding it and they keep hiding it. And eventually it's found out. And before everybody, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And they're like, yeah, you're only sorry because you got caught. <laughs> right? So how much better it is when you actually go to someone and say, I want to stop doing X, Y, Z, but I can't. It's a bad addiction or whatever. Okay, so let me give you a few examples from our list here in 1 Corinthians 5. Okay, are you going to expect, now this, uh, the false prophet isn't in this list, but that's another person that we would kick out of the church, right? Someone's preaching uh, false gospel. Now, let me just say this real quickly, and a certain individual's not here, but sometimes you'll get a person starts coming to church and they're not getting the gospel, they're not understanding it, or they're not getting some major doctrine or something like that. When they're new and you don't know anything about them, I think there is a, there is a, a need to show a little bit of grace. Okay, but there does come a point where you're like, hey, this person is not receiving the gospel. They're not accepting it. They're, you know, for all I know, they're going to go preach a false gospel to everybody in here. They need to be kicked out. Okay, that's just the way that it is. Uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, you give them a little bit of leeway just at the beginning because you're hoping that you can bring them to the truth. Okay, now there's methods that I'm going to try to conclude with uh, some, some ways to handle that whenever you see it. Okay, if you're not the pastor, which would be all of you. <laughs> okay. Are you going to expect, though, a false prophet to tell you the truth, right? Hey, are you teaching false doctrines to people? No. I mean, what are you going to expect them to be like, you know, why, yes, I am. Let me tell you all the people that I've given my false gospel to and, and I've tried to teach them this and that. They're not going to do that, right? Uh, you might be dealing with, depending, if they're preaching a false gospel, damnable heresy, like uh, wrong on salvation and they're preaching that to people, it, it's possible. Now, they could just be wrong, but hopefully they, if that was the case, you could set them straight and they would see that. But that could be that they're just a flat out reprobate and whatever their motivation is in trying to get people to turn their way. You don't want them to have any part of, of uh, trying to preach their false doctrines. Okay. So there is, that is uh, one per type of person that's supposed to be uh, removed from the church. Here's another one is fornicator. Are you going to expect, or let me just lump these together, a fornicator or an extortioner. Extortioner would be, you know, a type of theft, basically like, like uh, cheating people out of their money, or I guess there's lots of things that could be extortion. We tend to think of it from like a, a modern point of view where, 
inside trading or uh, I think there's some computer fraud type things that would be called extortion. I'm not quite sure what the definition is, but the idea is like robbing somebody from their money or cheating them out of their money or whatever, okay? Or a railer. A railer would be somebody who gets up and is just always condemning people and and possibly, I don't think it always has to be this case, but uh, but probably involved in that would be telling lies about them and stuff like that. But the idea about railing, you know, is just like, hey, they're just, they're just trying to, you know, just call everybody out and they're just like, you know, putting everybody's name in the mud and, uh, and trying to talk bad things about them. That could be a railer. Now you expect a person who's involved in these sins, fornication, extortion, really, you think they're going to tell you the truth? Probably not. Say, hey, are you doing this? No, no. What are you talking about? I, I've never stole money in my life. <laughs> you know, I've never fornicated with anybody because they're not going to just, they're involved in a sin that they don't necessarily just want everybody to know about. Okay. And another example, is the drunk the whole idea of drunkards okay drunkards in all kinds of addictions okay drugs i would say the dr you know you don't see a lot about drug use in the bible i mean some people have tried to talk about um uh you know different mixing of substances that you find in the bible maybe that is the equivalent but here's the idea we're supposed to be of a sober mind say if so if there's any substance if alcohol is bad because of what it does to your, uh, your, your mind and your, your sobriety, you know, then obviously drugs are going to be the same way. And so, uh, so I believe all that is the, the same, but I would also include like, you know, major like gambling addictions, pornography addictions, uh, you know, but even there's some other things that people could be addicted to like have really bad addictions to, and, uh, and, and, and you wouldn't even think about this, but it, it could even be part of this, like somebody who is, is addicted to shopping. <laughs> I mean, talking about like they're always in debt because they're just like buying stuff that they don't have the money for because they want to have the best things and nicest things or whatever. That could be a bad addiction. Uh, binge eating, right? People who are addicted to just, man, I just, I got to eat. I got to, every time I stop at the store, I just got to eat some, you know, I got to buy something from the gas station. I got to do this. They just want to just eat all the time. Now here are now that would be uh, that could lead to or or could even be uh, gluttony, okay? But uh, but where does that fit in into this list? Well, if you think about it, covetous. How do you judge somebody as, as being covetous? Right, this person's covetous. Well, how do you know that? Well, if they're just like constantly have this desire for money, constantly have a, a desire for things, then that's probably showing a sign of covetousness. Now, that's a harder one to judge and say, hey, this person is being covetous. Uh, but I think it's a real problem. But if you go to somebody who's a drunkard or they got this bad drug addiction or they got some addicted to pornography or something like that, and you say, hey, are you addicted to this? No, no, what are you talking about? What gave you that idea? <laughs> you know, because they're not going to tell you, they're not going to want to tell you the truth. Many of those people look, Many people that are in addictions, now this is, I believe, a, addictive type sins like this is in a whole category of its own. I guess anything could be addictive. Lying could be addictive or whatever. But I think substance like chemical uh, abuse and I think, I think that addictions can cause somebody to, I mean, they hate it. They want to be out of it. They want help but they won't go to anybody for help because it's embarrassing. And they don't want anybody to know the destructive, uh, the, the, the destruction that this is playing on their life and all this kind of stuff. And so look, I, 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 I've never been involved in that kind of thing. Uh, addictions, yes, we can all relate to addictions. You know, uh, if, if I got to pick something on the list, mine's the food thing, okay, let's be honest. Uh, and so, uh, so there's, uh, you know, and I've had struggles, I've mentioned this, I've, I've I'm very ashamed of it, but I've mentioned that I struggled with pornography in the past and I've made that clear to people and uh, had to uh, deal with that and talk to my wife about that and things and get that right because addictions can take a hold of somebody unknowingly and it can have such a pull over you and it can just, it just, can just pull you to a point where you, and you don't want anybody to know because you keep thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nip, nip it in the bud. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to fight this. I'm going to stop this from happening. But you keep on falling back into it. Look, there comes a point though you know somebody's involved in it, you know somebody has that, you've got to say, look, the only way this person could ever be restored to the point where they don't cause a huge, you know, uh, uh, blemish on the church is that they need to be dealt with in a, and strictly dealt with and maybe kicked out, uh, probably kicked out, depending on the extent of what happens and how they react to it and how they deal with it when confronted with it. 
but you're not going to expect that they're going to tell the truth about it, okay? And the, I, and the, and the truth is Romans 3, 4, I'm not going to give the whole context of this verse. I, you could say I'm using it out of context, but, but it, it doesn't matter. This little phrase in this verse stands alone, okay? You can use it. it it's not out of context. You can use it in any way. Let God be true and every man a liar, okay? In any counseling situation, you know, Let's say you're counseling. I've, I've counseled a lot of people that are that are on drugs, for instance, or they've had a history of drugs or whatever. And here's what I've told them: You, because I don't I don't know all the signs. I don't know what to look for. But I will say that hey, you, I can guarantee this: at some point, you know, you're going to struggle with the sin. If you fall back in that sin, and I ask you about it, you're going to lie to me, right? That's just the nature of of addictions, right? You don't want people to know, so you're going to lie to them. We need to know that we can't. So how dare you call me a liar? Well, the Bible says all men, let, all, let every man, uh, let God be true and every man a liar. I'm only going to believe the Bible, right, over man. I'm going to believe God's word over man. And look, there's a obviously there's a time to trust your loved ones and stuff like that. But overall, when it comes to uh, dealing with certain subjects, you have to understand they're capable of lying to you. And if they're involved in addiction, stuff like that, they probably will. All right. And so you can't expect them uh, to tell you the truth about their addictions. But here's the thing. If you notice. The signs are there. And how's the old saying go? If it looks like a duck and it waddles like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Right. So the first thing you do is you see the signs and somebody says, I think we're dealing with somebody who has one of these problems. All right. What do we do? Somehow we need to investigate, but what's it going to start with? It's got to start with that appearance of evil. And you can go to them and say, hey, are you doing this? No. What are you talking about? Like, that's not enough. <laughs> we have to still watch for the signs and see. Now, if they say no, and then they just kind of prove themselves to be clean and they don't ever, there's never problems with it again, then, hey, we were wrong. But at some point you have to start with that and then keep investigating and find out uh, what's going on. Secondly, this is sort of related here, but uh, again, real simple. How do we, uh, I mean, I mean, why can't we just take them at their word? Uh, number one, people will lie. Number two, we can't see their heart, right? We can't see their heart. We can only see their actions. Now, you, it's real popular now for people to be like, hey, don't judge a book by its cover. Or they'll say, you know, uh, you know, don't ever judge a person based on, this or that. And I understand what they're saying. There is some truth to that. But look, the, the truth of the matter is all the verses in the Bible talk about not judging has to do with, hey, don't judge somebody like the beam in the eye sort of thing. Don't judge somebody. And then you're guilty of the same sins that you're judging from. Okay. So it doesn't just say never judge. In fact, the Bible says a lot about judging. And the fact is we can only judge a person by their behavior and what they do. We can only judge by the outward appearance, you know, and it could be that they're really good at, at, at lying and, you know, and they might get away with it. For, you know, God's the judge, but they might get away with it for a while in our eyes because we aren't good enough to spot that. But when we see the signs, we can only say, look, I think something's wrong here. My eyes are telling me that there's a problem. Then we can begin to uh, look into that. Now, Look, we use this all the time for salvation, preaching the gospel. Like, hey, I can't see your heart. I, almost every time I lead somebody in a prayer, I say, look, I can't see your heart. I don't know if you really believe the gospel. I don't know if you're really going to trust Jesus for your salvation or if you're just lying to me. Right. But if you say that you believe this and you mean this in your heart, you know, then I'll say something like, hey, let's just tell God. It's not a magical prayer, but let's just tell God you believe that. And, uh, and basically what I'm saying is I'm going to take you at your word. Because I can't see your heart. I can only go with what your lips said. Some people take that a step further, and then most people go way too far on this, but they'll say, hey, we, we won't know until we see their fruits. Okay, and I think they miss uh, I think they misapply Matthew 7 on that, okay, because it's talking about false prophets. You'll know them by their fruits. But look, there's some reality, and you can look at James and you can say, look, there's some reality to the fact that somebody can say they're a Christian, but if they're not living like a Christian, at some point we just got to assume, hey, I don't. And you say, where's the biblical basis for that? Well, Jesus said, 
You know, if you have a problem with your brother, you go to that brother. If, if he rejects you, then you take somebody else with you and you guys go to them together. He rejects you. You take it before the church and he rejects the church. Treat them like a heathen and a publican. He didn't say they're not saved. He just said at this point, you just treat them like they're not saved because what, <laughs> by all appearances, they're not. Okay. Why do we kick people out that are involved in these sins? Because these are major sins that Christians shouldn't be doing. And so if they're going to do these sins and they're not going to be repentant of that and they're not, you know, hey, there's nothing we can do except say, well, then you can't be a part of us. Not saying that they're not saved, but we're saying for all practical purposes, you're acting like somebody who's not saved. And so we're going to have to treat you like somebody who's, who's not saved. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of a, I mean, if they're not saved, obviously we're giving them the gospel and we're <laughs> inviting them to church and stuff. So it's a little different after you kick somebody out of a church. But, uh, but we use that for salvation, and so it's the same thing with a, a believer. Now, Jesus did say in John 7, 24, he said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Okay, But here's what he's saying is don't just go off of appearance and not investigate and not find out if that's true or not, okay? Because our eyes could deceive us. We could be wrong about certain things. So it's not enough just to say, well, it looks like this is going on. And then just next thing you know, it gets around the church, hey, so-and-so is involved in a sin or something like that. No, that's not right. What we need to do is say, well, it looks like this. We're concerned about this. Let's investigate that or, or whatever. So I'm not saying to just make a final decision based on what, what you see, but we do want to begin are uh, with that judgment, begin the judgment based on the appearance of evil. All right, well, I, I, I hope that makes sense. I want to conclude uh, by saying this, but, but I hope you understand where I'm going with this. I believe this is an important thing that we look way more than just like, hey, don't judge me. You know, you live your life, I'll live my life. No, actually, the Bible says that we're supposed to uh, judge each other and we're supposed to try to want to as a body of, of believers to to have a, a, a church that's run well that's ruled well and uh, and this and there are things in place to make sure that people don't just live however they want and do whatever damage that uh, can be done okay so in conclusion I want to leave you with this if if you notice okay here first of all if you notice somebody who you think might be guilty of one of these things okay it fits the profile you're looking at it i've had people come to me before that i and i didn't notice something and they noticed it and they brought it to me and uh and i had to begin to investigate that's fine but i i would say this first when you know, think that you see something like this happening all right and maybe this will clear it up if you've misunderstood anything i've said so far first of all pray for that person as soon as you notice it, start praying for them, okay? That's the best thing you can do because, our, again, our motive shouldn't be, I want to gossip. Our motive shouldn't be like, ooh, I can't wait to, you know, tell on this person and get this person in trouble, right? Our, our desire should be that we keep the church clean and that we help our brothers and sisters who might be struggling with the sin, okay? And so, first of all, pray for them. Secondly, go to them privately and in love see what you can do to help them and find out if they will talk to you and confess uh, what's going on so that we can begin the process of, of, uh, of restoration. Now, if you don't feel like it's your place to go to that person, there are certain situations where, hey, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to go to that person, but I really want something to be done about that. I don't believe there's anything wrong with you coming to the pastor and telling them in private. Now, we're not talking about gossip. And it might be a situation where I never do anything about it because I, I, it's just hearsay or something like that. But if it's a legitimate concern, I understand. Uh, and if you're a woman, you know, just you can go to my wife. And, uh, and it might be a situation that we can work on and we can look into. Uh, I can understand not everybody wants to or sometimes it's not even appropriate to go to a person that you're concerned about in this way. But definitely avoid gossiping and uh, and passing it around to other people before the thing's been looked into and investigated. Secondly, if you are involved in one of these things, you know, I, I could just imagine, I don't, I'm not saying that anybody is involved in anything. I could just imagine someone's involved in some of these things and they're sitting here in this message and they're thinking, now what do I do? <laughs> right? Do I continue to hide it? Do I uh, uh, just go and repent and just don't ever tell anybody about it? Which by, which, by the way, I think there's a time to do that. Uh, 
I don't have to know every sin that you ever committed. I think that somebody can get right and be restored and nobody ever knew anything about it. But typically it doesn't work that way. Typically until somebody gets help with some of these serious things, they will keep on doing it. They'll fall back into sin and they'll eventually be found out. So it could be a situation where you have to confess your faults. And, ha and again, confess your fault doesn't always mean tell everybody every little sin that you've committed. I'm talking about major things uh, that I think confess your fault has more to do with like what I said about, you know, sometimes I, I know I'm your pastor, but sometimes I'm slow to to execute this or that or that. I'm not going to get up here and confess every sin <laughs> that I've ever committed. You know what I mean? But I'm going to confess my faults. Hey, I'm struggling in this area. You should know this about my personality or something. I think that's what it means when it says confess your faults. But there is a, a time that you have to come to somebody and say, man, I need help. I don't want to be that person who's caught and kicked out of the church or whatever. Uh, look, I would encourage you to, to seek help and to do that. If you don't think that you can uh, ever get out of that, um, go to, you could go to me or you could go to somebody else. There could be a, a friend or, or a loved one that it's easier to go to them and uh, seek wise biblical counsel. But if that if you're a member of this church and somebody comes to you and they uh, that is a member of this church and they're involved in that you're probably going to have to let me know about it so that we can deal with it. and I hope you know my personality and know enough that I'm not going to expose somebody just off the cuff and just embarrass them and all that stuff but we truly want and not just me uh, I think everybody in this church truly wants people that are struggling with these things to be restored unless like I said they're false prophet or somebody who's uh who's just a wicked person who is, there's not going to be restoration. They're good. <clears throat> but how do you know that? Well, it starts with the appearance and then it starts with saying, hey, we need to do something about this. Okay. All right, let's go Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your church and I thank you for your word that uh, although we might sometimes want to see different things in your word about the matter, you have given us plenty to know how to rule your church and how to uh, conduct ourselves in the house of God. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, help me as a leader to be make strong dis, uh, uh, decisions that might need to be made and, to, and to, to do it boldly and without hesitation. Then I pray that you would help everybody else in the church to be understanding of, uh, of this situation that we're talking about and to be um, that we would all be on the same page as far as wanting to keep the church clean so that we can bring more glory to you and that we could be a light to the world, a pure light to the world that's so dark and, and needs you and needs your word. So, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to have wisdom and to know how to do this and guide and direct as you have done so, so much in our lives in this church. Uh, I pray you guide and direct, have your will and way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.